Hi everybody and welcome to Modern Barber Goes Live. Today we're joined by Carl Hinder and we're going to be chatting about why your price isn't always right. Um, Carl is a salon business coach and he's going to be chatting us about how to price correctly, when to raise your prices and why it's a topic he'll never tire of talking about. Welcome Carl. Thank you Charlotte, thank you for uh, inviting me on board today and um, absolutely it is it is a subject that we can repeat and repeat and repeat until we eventually get the whole industry into the right kind of um, at the right level. Amazing. So why is it such an age old topic that you basically don't tire of talking about and always seems to be relevant? And why aren't businesses getting it right? OK, look, I mean, we can analyze it, you know, to, to death in a way. But I think there's a couple of things that are stopping us getting pricing right. And I think it kind of goes back to who the salon owners are. And um, when you think about it, salon owners aren't, they don't start off as entrepreneurs. Most of them, and I'm talking about all the sectors now, the barbering beauty hair sectors, you know, they start off as great barbers and they work their way through and they eventually wake up one morning and they own a salon. So they haven't necessarily got loads and loads of business experience. And maybe they haven't done any business training. So they're in a situation where their passion is their skill, where their passion is their creativity. And the most important thing to them is just get started. So it, it, it's almost, when you, when you look at it from a business point of view, it's a bit, oh, you know, it's a bit irregular. It's, it does, it's not rational, but it is really, when you think about it, that's how, how barbers start. They go through all those steps, wake up one morning, got a salon, and invariably the, the price is, is not right. But I think the other reason, once they realize that, I think a lot of the reason that people's uh, prices are wrong is because of their own personal money beliefs. And again, same with all the sectors. And it hasn't got anything to do with them being good salon owners or smart salon owners. It's got to do with their own personal money beliefs. I don't think uh, quite a lot of the time they believe that what they do is worth it. I don't think they wouldn't pay let's say 30 pounds for a haircut. So there's no way on earth are they going to charge 30 pounds for a haircut or 20 pounds. I'm just picking a number. So I think there's the two things. I think you you grow up as, as, as a creative person and you end up with a salon and it's like a bit of a shock. Um, or your money beliefs are, well, I wouldn't pay for that. Therefore, my clients shouldn't or, or wouldn't. Brilliant. That's really interesting. I really like the the money beliefs angle to it that feels really um fresh and i'd love to yeah get into that with some more barbers and like try and explore that that more hopefully at some yeah I, I think we could do a thing on money yeah. you know what yeah. i mean Be because um we won't do it today don't worry carry on <laughs> <laughs> shall i just ring some people up now and we'll just get yeah. them on yeah, we're, yeah, live. we're live <laughs> <laughs> you know and we probably get a great reaction because yeah. It is people just don't get the the value that they got to have. I think too many people think that they're actually selling a haircut, yeah. and yeah. that's not what they're so selling. Much more. You know, it's like yeah. you know, I don't a premium car like a Porsche. They're not selling a car, are they? They're not selling you something to get to work. Well, you get to work very fast, you know. But you, they're selling you a feeling, an experience, and an emotion. And a lifestyle, and yeah. Yeah, and and I think um, the more that we switch on to realize that we we're, we're not really selling a haircut, we we we're selling a whole lot more than that. Then we'll realize we can charge a lot more. And so, how can you tell if your prices are correct? And is correct even a phrase that we should be using? Yeah, no, I. I no, correct is is correct because um, I try to use that word all the time. Correct instead of uh, when I say I don't like to tell salons increase your prices, not knowing how far off base they are in the first place. Okay. So yeah, this uh, their prices should absolutely be termed correct. Um, not everyone needs to increase their prices, but I haven't met a salon in reality that that hasn't. You know, there's going to be salons out there that will be correctly priced. Um, how do they know? Well, there's two things. First of all, they're definitely going to know when they look in their bank account. They're definitely going to know when they've got to pay a big bill. They'll definitely know next time COVID comes and they're two weeks in and they skint. Um, that's a, a pretty good indication that your prices aren't right. But look, 
for salons that are open today, for barbershops that are open today and they want to know that answer, they've got to go and work it out. It, it's what I like about pricing, you know, as a business coach, what I like about most things that are non-emotional, it's a mathematical equation. It's got nothing to do about how I feel about a price. It's simply a mathematical um, calculation. So when I'm looking for, is something correct? It's easy. Go and work it out. Uh, I'm not going to do the full calculation with you. Don't worry. But, you know, when you... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Let's get up there. This is going to turn into a four-hour session. Um, The calculations, you know, it's really just a, a matter of, adding up all the true costs. And I use that word true as opposed to just like, you know, we got the rent and we got the overhead, but then we really got to delve in, particularly now COVID's done. Uh, oh, I hope it's done at least. Um, you know, we've got bounce back loans to add in. We've got PPE, we got deferred VAT, we've got deferred taxes, we've got people who haven't paid their rent. we got salons that have got staff where the um, holidays still haven't been um, utilized. That's a big, big debt, not just the holiday pay, but the loss of sales during that period. But all of these things need to go into a calculation, even um, when we're out of all of those, those scary little areas, even when we're working them out just for ourselves and our team, we've got to work out how many holidays they're going to have, um, how much that's going to cost us, what if we've got someone on sick. Now, you can't expect, I don't expect at least, the average salon owner to grab a calculator, um, turn into an accountant and work it out. So the, you know, there's only a couple of ways of doing this um, accurately. Either you do go and get yourself a good accountant um, or you go and do something like grab my pricing app. You know, there's, there's a few pricing apps on the market. None like mine, Charlotte, of course, of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> none, none like mine. Um, but what you want is, I know that salon owners of all, you know, of all size salons can get their hands on the information. You know, they can grab how much the rent is from the their bank statement. They can grab how much tax they paid last year from last year's account. So they can grab all the information. I just think it's nice to be able to put it all into one little pot and this number pops out the other end that says, you know, if this is all true, yeah. your, your haircut price should be this. And I, I, I think that's uh, that kind of little bit of magic allow, gives you some confidence. Brilliant. Um, and I must encourage people if they're watching this live or even if they're watching it later today when you're back home after work, um, do comment with any questions or any thoughts on the session. Um, and either myself or, or Carl will get those hopefully answered for mm. you. And it would be great to know as well, like we were talking about the you know, your relationship to, to money as well, that we were saying, ooh, can't wait to hear from Barbara's about this. So yeah, please do comment if you've got any um, thoughts on the session today. So I know for a lot of barber shops that I talk to, they are very fixated on what their neighboring barber shops are doing, what the barber shop down the road is doing. What do you say to people who are comparing prices? With the you were dying to say that, weren't you? You were dying to get that in because if you've seen me once, or so if anyone's ever seen me once talk about this, it's a bit of a, an animated thing. So we do what we know. We know from um, salons I've worked with, we know from industry stats, there's some kind of well-worn figures um, that we can use. We know that seven out of 10 barbers and salons in the UK are operating at break-even or at a loss. So, and if you're at break-even today, you're at a loss tomorrow. Because if you're, if you're taking 10 pounds today and your overheads are 10 pounds today, we know tomorrow electric, water, gas, coaching fees, Everything has gone up a little bit by tomorrow. So if you're at break even or at a lot, uh, or you run at a loss, you're going to continue in that vein. Now, if you look down the high street and you're one of 10 shops, there's a fair chance on that statistic that seven of them are at break even or a loss. So if you come along and you say, right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to upset the apple cart here. I'm going to dive in and I'm going to undercut some of them. I'm going to undercut all of them. Or I'm going to match them. You know, nobody's going to beat me. I'm going to match them. Well, you have a 70% chance of starting your business in a loss situation. Not good odds. No, but could you imagine if you was phoning up a coach and saying, um, you know, what what should I do? And they said, you listen, 
you're gonna if you do this, you're gonna have a seventy percent chance. You wouldn't do it. it. No, no person in the right mind would take have a seventy percent chance of starting at a loss. So that is, is simply going to mean that you you're going to end up in failure, and it's that race to the bottom. That's not my terminology. It, it's a common terminology. Because if I if I come to your town, you're at 12, 15 pounds for a haircut. I come in at 11. Maybe I will get a whole, whole army of clients. But it's not very long before the next barber comes along and, and comes in at 10. And the barber at 9 and the barber at 8. And it just means that a whole tranche of you are operating at, at, at a very, very low level. I mean, I, I think it's, it's for, for transparency. I should declare my hand because... I did exactly the same. Yeah, when I, when I opened my first salon, uh, even though I had good business knowledge, I thought I need to position myself in the market. Yeah. Now, luckily, I didn't do that. Luckily, I went. You're all at this level. I'm going up here. Yeah. 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 But I, I gotta say, there was a there was an element of of luck in that because maybe another day, another year, I might have gone. No, no, I'm I'm going to compete on price. Mm -hmm. So, uh, look, the answer is absolutely no way should you ever, ever, ever look at your competition in set in your prices. Because you look down the street and you don't, it doesn't look like you can look in these beautiful shops and they've got, you know, beautiful big windows and they've got all this signage and they've got half a dozen barbers and you don't know that they're running at a loss. There's all sorts of reasons why businesses can continue to run at a loss. There's barbers out there not even paying themselves. You know what I mean? They've got big, shiny shops. Um, they don't pay themselves. When I say they don't pay themselves, I mean they probably don't pay themselves as much as they could. They don't pay themselves as uh, sometimes as much as they pay their staff. And so sometimes there's a bit of a, an egotistical way of running your business, which is all about, you know, I am the business owner. And I love doing what I'm doing. I love my clients. I want to be seen as the best. Mm -hmm. But very often when we use that, that price point, they're never going to get there. You can't get there. When your prices are wrong, everything's wrong. It, 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 just, it just has to follow. You can't even go marketing. You can't even, do a, you can't even do a discount deal. Not that that's my style. But, you know, if, you're, if your prices are already a pound under what they should be, and then you have this great idea to um, let's discount this to fill the place up. You're filling it with people who can never make you any money. So how regularly should people be re-evaluating their prices and what they charge? Okay, well, if you if you got um if you got a tool like my pricing app, I would say really often because what the part of the reason I developed it, apart from people don't understand pricing, people don't have the time uh, or the inclination, is this. I would say just to answer your question, Charlotte, directly. I would say you need to review twice a year. Okay. So, you, you know, maybe something like, I don't know, January and April when, you know, uh, minimum wage is changing or um, when you're feeling really ambitious in January or maybe around the September mark where you're thinking, I've got to be ready for Christmas. I can't afford to go in. Now, that doesn't mean I would change two or three times a year unless something massive in your business has changed. So maybe since the last time you changed your prices, you've taken on three more staff. I mean, the dynamics of, of your pricing when you've got more staff is huge. Maybe you've moved premises, only two doors, um, but you've left the same structure in place because you don't want to detract uh, or, or deter, rather, um, your clients. So I would say a couple of times a year you should review, and I certainly think a minimum of once a year you need to have your prices going up high enough that it exceeds things like inflation and and also, it's, it's going to be tied into your ambitions as well. So it's, it's really very, um, really important that we look at them every year. But the other part, and I keep mentioning the app, but it's because what you also should be doing is having a look at um, your, the effect of your actions on your pricing. So as an example, Lots of people head towards it. This may be something we should edge on a little bit in the conversation if, if you've got time, Charlotte, yeah, is, yeah. Is, v, is VAT. Yeah? Yeah. So imagine being able to sit down with it all laid out in front of you and you just prop 20% VAT 
into your figures and it says because it's not just a matter of adding it on because you've got to deduct all of your purchases right so it's not as simple as that but imagine having the ability to go i'll pop vat in there and if i went to vat level my prices would be up here lots of people are scared by that do you know what i mean and that's why there's so many salons under the vat level um maybe you want to know what would my prices be if i had two more barbers what would my prices be like if i changed product range what would my prices be like if i took on another floor in in this building so i would say if you're a static business where you're just kind of happily going along check them once or twice a year if you're a progressive business keep checking them keep checking them oh. and at this moment in time so coming out of a third lockdown hopefully everyone is reopened or on the route to reopening right now is now the right time to raise your prices would you consider making that bold move now the best time was a month ago damn it <laughs> the next time the, the best time was a month ago the next best time is today now oh. absolutely the next best time is today and if they if there are barbershops out there that haven't raised their prices i think you should really really analyze why you haven't yeah. because um your overheads have definitely gone up all right now i don't know every one of the viewers and someone's going to come and jump on me and go well my never <laughs> i'm talking to the industry as a whole your your figures have gone up because your ppe went up all right you are you have got a bounce back loan coming out next month you have got even if you only had grants you probably got more taxation coming your way your landlord is still waiting for the 2 3000 pounds that you owe him or her and all of these things and we talked about um uh, what do we talk about holiday pay and all of those things so when you do in a price increase it shouldn't be for what's happened okay your price increases should be a forecast of what you're going to do so that's so all you're doing with the price is you're gathering money so let's say uh that you um have managed to manage managed to manage all of those things like um holidays and and all that sort of stuff and now um you're thinking to the future but let's say you know that your shop's a bit shoddy and you want five new chairs well five new chairs these days are probably a couple of grand each call it 10 grand okay what you don't want to do and say right these chairs i've got are only going to last me six months i need five new chairs in six months time that's ten thousand pounds we should put that calculation into the price today so when I jog along and I come to five months time or six months time, I open up my bank account. I go five new chairs, please. Um, here's the ten thousand pounds, Mr. Chairperson, and I got my chairs. What we do, traditionally speaking, is we'll get to that point, realize that the arms are falling off and the springs are coming out, and we either go and to get that on some sort of lease agreement. So we we now fund this with a debt, and we spend months, if not years, chasing the debt, or we do things like we 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 uh, what do you say we compromise ourselves we um start saying well i'll take a little bit less every week mm -hmm. you know what i mean I, i'll i'll go down from 400 pounds down to a hundred uh, down to 300 pounds or 300 to 200 so what we should be doing with prices is thinking about the future so your pricing now pays for things in the future don't set prices for what happened uh, over the last mm -hmm. year so the answer is absolutely right now you, and the reason I said last month, because last month, even right now to a degree, unless people have been under a rock or in a cave, they know what's happened. They know that you've been through hell and back in some cases. You know, you, they know that you've had no money coming in. They know that you've had to take extra time because of um, COVID restrictions. They know. And the other thing as well, which is why I would love for it to have been done next last month, not next month, is that much of society, not all of society, but much of society is cash rich at the moment. Because, you know, all, all sectors, they haven't been able to go on holiday. They haven't been able to go to a restaurant. They haven't even been able to put fuel in their car. Um, even the sectors that we normally protect, like services or, or OAPs, they haven't been able to go to bingo. They haven't been able to go... You know what I mean? So the society generally, unless it's um, a few of those people who have been unfortunate enough to be made redundant or something, mm -hmm. are currently cash rich. But they're also, 
I think on the whole, a lot more respectful of what we provide for them. Yeah. I mean, you, we heard all the stories, which we won't discuss in too much detail, of um, you know some sectors of our industry behaving inappropriately um, in terms of of going outside of um, government regulation. Um, well, that was a sign uh, of how desperate people are to have a great service from us. Mm -hmm. So the answer is your prices should have gone up last month. The best, next best time is today. And the prices are a forecast of your future, not uh, an indication of your past. I love that saying, going to get that tattooed. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we need that on some sort of um, billboard or bumper yeah. sticker. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're going to go into business on T-shirts, uh, Charlotte. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. Um, so a bit of a controversial question from me. Would you ever recommend that barbers lower their prices? Uh, I can't think of a time that that not would be yeah. something that I would do. Um, the reason that I'm so pro advance in pricing, I, I will try and answer you honestly in, in some sort of way here. The reason I'm so pro growing prices is because if I had 10 barbers in a room, random 10 barbers, one of the key things they would complain about would be, um, the competition. We've got too much competition, Carl. We've got so much competition. I can't do this and I can't do that. You see, to me, all the time your prices are like theirs, that means your operation is also like theirs. So if I move into your town and there's 10 barbers in on a high street and you're all 12, 15 pounds, there's nothing that tells me that there's a big differential. So one of the key reasons I'd be encouraging you in conjunction with your service standards uh, to go to 20 pounds or 23 pounds or 25 pounds or whatever is because now you stand out. And I can't see too many um, low-cost operations um, being financially successful just simply because you can't process enough people anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, I think, you know, barbershops that are down at that £5 you know, haircut, and there's still a few out there, are, are clearly not doing it to grow, um, to grow their business to, a, you know, you know, a a seven figure business they're clearly happy with the lifestyle that that provides for them personally mm -hmm. uh, and i'm okay for them because i i'm not a lifestyle coach i'm i'm a i'm a massive not passive sales growth coach you know um so i'm happy for them but you shouldn't be considering them in your operation mm -hmm. so the answer is i can't think of anything i can't think of any reasons why i would come along to you as a coach or say to you now have a look at your prices and lower them a little bit because even probably since i started this 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 chat with you charlotte prices of something have gone up yeah you know what i mean your your wholesale prices have gone up your electric's gone up something or something has gone up so the very best or the very worst depending on how, on your point of view that i would expect was that you you you, you hold station Mm -hmm. But I would only also say hold station if you were already 100% certain that your prices were correct. So, so you was being controversial on me, but I, I can't think of anything. No, uh, it's got to be a big no from me. Cool. Thank you. I'm really well explained. Appreciate that. <laughs> so what is the single biggest mistake that barbers make when pricing their services, would you say? Okay. Um, I don't think there is one. I think you you hit the biggest one with an earlier question. It's the competition. Yeah. Uh, that is by far the biggest pricing mm -hmm. mistake that most barbers, most hairdressers, most therapists make is that they feel as if they have to compete on price. We are obsessed. Mm -hmm. We're obsessed with price. And all the time we are obsessed with price, we are gonna we are going to convey that to our clients. That yeah. they should also be conveyed. Uh, they should also be obsessed yeah. with price. Yeah. But I think there are other things. I think the next big thing is relationships. I think I don't think enough of us see our clients as clients. I think the relationship between uh, the barber and their client is much more is much too too close. Mm -hmm. I don't. 
Yeah, I think I think it's much too close. I think we are not prepared to charge the client the right amount of money because in some way we are guarding or protecting them. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes when we have staff, you'll hear this a lot, and we hear it with retail a lot as well, that the client doesn't have much money, right? Yeah. Um, or our prices are too high or the client doesn't have enough money. Now, what some of the things I talk about when I'm coaching is this. First of all, let's say, um, if it was a member of staff making those comments, first of all, I would say to the member of staff, um, I don't know if what you're saying is true or not, but really, what's it got to do with you? <laughs> because <laughs> you can't, I can't think of any other instance where the employee would actually protect the customer from the price. You know, Imagine going to... A pub. I, and... Go away, sorry. Going to the pub. Sorry, yes. I'm obsessed at the moment yeah. because, you know, we can't go. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, yeah. So, and then yeah. I'm like, oh, I'd, I'd like that, that pint, but I can't afford it. Yeah, well, it's not that. It's the other way around. It's actually the barman going, um, yeah, yeah, that you saying that you can't afford it, isn't it? Or, and I'm um, saying, actually, have, why don't you have a half instead or uh, have the cheaper cocktail or saying to his boss, she wanted four points, but I, I only gave her three. Um, because she's a bit skinned. Did you see the car she drove up in? Terrible. She must work for a terrible company, La Charlotte, right? So it only happens in our industry. It doesn't yeah. happen in restaurants, doesn't happen in bars, doesn't happen in curries, doesn't happen in Tesco's, right? So I think it's the thing that makes us really good as barbers and hairdressers is our relationship with the client. That's why we, that's why lots of people came into it. That's why lots of people are really good at what they do because they're great at making people look fantastic. Yeah, and feel fantastic, actually, not just look. So the bit that makes them awesome at that yeah. Uh, this is like a bit where I said they start off and they wake up one morning and go, oh, I'm, oh, I own a salon. Yeah. Well, they now gone, they've gone through all that. And what made them great isn't making them great entrepreneurs now. The other part of that thing about, well, you know, what's it got to do with you, which obviously I wouldn't say, but that's the, that, that's the kind of uh, emotion I think we should have with our stuff. Really, what's it got to do with you? Mm-hmm. Um, the kind of the other part of that is, where is it that, um, why is it your responsibility that the client can't afford it? Let's say it's true. Let's say the client can't afford that haircut. In what way is it your fault? I mean, is it your fault because they didn't do very well at school, because they were made redundant, because they didn't, they, they, they're only doing 16 hours a week, they didn't fancy the 40 hour job? Is it, is it your fault they were terrible at the interview? Is it your fault? Um, you know, it's not your fault that that person has created the inability to afford your service. So I think, first of all, we shouldn't be challenging ourselves uh, and talking ourselves into um, uh, judging whether they can afford it. Secondly, even if it were true, we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't be kind of looking at their income because it's not our fault. And thirdly, I think. It's usually not true. Thirdly, it's not true because if we were to listen to that client a bit more carefully, I bet you they're going on holiday this year. Oh, well, maybe not this year. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going far this year. But I bet you they, they're going on a holiday with their family. I bet you they're buying a new or different car. I bet you they're moving house. I bet you they're having um, Pizza Hut this weekend. Okay. And... Uh, you know, Pizza Hut, right? Just get pizza, not pizza, Domino's or something. You get Domino's delivered to your house now. And it's like four of you, five of you. It's like 60, 70, 80 quid. These pizzas are, are, are not, you know, they're not three pounds anymore. And then if you're having pizza with your family, you're going to have a bottle of wine. Maybe you're going to have two or three beers. And so Friday night now with a family is a hundred quid. So it wasn't that they couldn't afford the haircut. It was that they see that there was more value in having a uh, pizza with a family than there was having a haircut with you or having a haircut with you and a product. It's, it's, it's down to us. We've got to stop being barbers and stop being entrepreneurs. Word. Um, so obviously you work across the whole hair sector. Now, is there anything that barbers can learn particularly from um, hairdressing salons and vice versa? 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, there's a, it's a big difference, a big di- a difference in dynamic between the hair, beauty, and barbering sectors. I think the first thing the barbers could learn to do, and when I'm working with big barbering operations, is something I, I like to get involved with, is that we are not really, really engaged in systems. We, we don't seem to like, now I'm not saying that to every barbershop out there, there's some wonderful, wonderful barbershop operations that are like clockwork. But we're not very good at, at, at systemizing what we're doing. So uh, let, you know, whatever, let's say, um, I don't know, staff holiday systems, or let's say the consultation process, or, uh, or anything like that. We, we are very good I'm going to kind of pay the barbering sector a compliment. We, we're very good at working on the hoof. Yeah. We're very, very good at working hard. Yeah. You know, we'll stand behind that chair from eight in the morning till eight at night and seven days a week. But do you think we will actually put a procedure in place? Would, you know, if you go into a, a barbershop, a small operation, and, and, and you said something like, show me your um, refund policy, they'd be like, Carl. Refund policy? That's I don't. I'm a barber. I don't do that. You know, we we look after clets, and it's not my thing. And so I would say yes. I think both the hair and the beauty sector are way, way, way ahead of the barbering sector when it comes to systemizing the business. And I and I say that not out of trying to criticize the barbering sector. I just would like them all. I would like you all to make your lives a bit easier. I think that's really where. Um, that they could learn. I also think the barbering sector has got a, a, a big, big job to do on retailing. They are a little bit behind um, the hair sector and they are a, a world and a lifetime behind um, the beauty sector when it comes to systemizing. And then part of that is um, re, uh, retailing as well. So I think that's where I would be focusing. We, we're too narrow thinking when it comes to, um, I'll give you a quick example. I don't want to talk too much about retailing, but it is it's such a part of what we should be doing. So there's, um, I'll give you an example. There's a, a, um, a lovely barbershop that I work with and um, average price haircuts um, with the mentality that um, she wants to be middle of the road. She is, is happy to operate as an average um, place. So I, I said to her, right, wh- how many uh, GHD hair straighteners do you sell? And she said, none. I don't sell any. And I said, why? She said, because we're a men's salon. We're a barber's car. And I said, yeah. And all of these men, or well, the vast majority of these men, have got women in their life. You know, mothers, sisters, wives, girlfriends, whatever they got. And um, why aren't we selling them GHD straighteners? Particularly, you know, uh, Valentine's, Mother's Day, um, Christmas, you know, we get that picture. So she went away and she did her magic. And then she came back to me and she said, Carl, you won't believe this, but I just sold a GHD travel pack for 371 pounds, right? And I said, wow, fantastic, mind blowing. The next day she sends me a message, Carl, I just sold another one. And she said, I haven't ordered them yet. I only showed the picture, yeah, to the gent. And he said, oh my God, that solves my Christmas. So she did 700 and whatever it is, 40 odd quid in two days on two products. Mm-hmm. And I think that is about thinking wide. On, in barbering, we are narrow. We cannot think past hairstyle wax. We can't get past it. We can't, we can't, we can't go wide and we can't do impulse. So we go, sir, would you like the wax? They go, no, we go buy. Yeah. Okay. So to answer your question, I think the barbering sector needs to uh, learn a lot more of the, get a lot more systems, make their lives a lot easier. And they definitely need to start weighing on the retailing. I think um, the hair sector that like on the ladies side, what could they learn? And I don't know if it's they, they could learn, but they definitely could um, identify or rejuvenate something. You see, what the barbering sector, in my opinion, is fantastic at is it has lots of dynamism, doesn't it? And and it has a lot of passion. I mean, you look at retail, it's really ironic, really, that if you look at barbering over the last 10 years, there are hundreds of products. The opportunity for retail is vast. Yeah. Yeah. 
But in the hair sector, it's been pretty static. Only a few products have come in and a few products have gone out. Look at the passion in the barbering sector. You know, uh, look at the event coming up for Barberfest. You know, it's more, much more dynamic than some of the other events. Look at um, the, the competition. I mean, I used to be involved uh, with um, competitions, hairdressing competitions uh, in Wales. Now, you don't see much of that going on in the UK anymore. The, the passion for that has gone, but it hasn't gone in the barbering sector. There's still people hungry to get involved with competition. So I would say if I was, you know, sat in the hairdressing sector and I was looking to the barbers for something, I would say, look, I, 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 we need to be more dynamic like the barbering sector. We need to be a lot more passionate um, um, like the barbering sector. And there was another area as well that I think um, is a compliment. And this isn't to do with hair ladies against gents. This is to do with barbering versus, versus I've, I've started, a, I've, I've stirred something up now. It's not a competition um, versus the booty sector as much as anything. Okay. What the barbering sector has been really good at is focusing on the core skills, on the core services. In the beauty sector, a little bit on the hairdressing sector, we get we do get a bit guilty. We think the next the the, the next solution is the next shiny thing. Okay. Yeah. You know. So we, you know. So if I got a business problem, we'll bring on that service, and we'll bring on that service, and we'll bring on that service. Um, I think those parts of the industry should look at Barbara and say, look, we only do a few things, and we do them superbly well. You know, we do all types of haircuts to a very very high standard. Some um, salons that are some some of the barbershops that have identified this as an opportunity do shave into a very very high standard, um, and there's a few other things I understand. Obviously, we got waxing and and all that sort of stuff. But on the whole, without without dragging the male grooming um, sector into this too much, they're very good. Barbering sector focuses on do it delivering a few things to a high standard, whereas the beauty sector is currently trying to deliver a thousand things to a high standard. <laughs> <laughs> so um i think we should all be watching and listening we could you know what we can learn stuff from people outside our industry you you yeah. can learn stuff just by going to tesco's you can learn stuff by going to restaurants i learn tons by going to restaurants you know you, you want to learn about real service guys in the barbering sector in the hair sector in any sector go to a real good restaurant go to a really good hotel go to the counter go to the reception in a hotel yeah, see how they treat you. I don't mean the travel lodge, by the way. Um, I mean, you know, where you, where there's a machine. Um, I mean, go and have a look how it's done. I mean, one of the things that's happened, uh, a little mini, miniature great story for me in the last few days, is one of my salons, we've kind of rebuilt the way we've done things, or, or I've I, I've helped her mold. She's done all the work in fairness to her, um, was to bring in a receptionist. And she... And I, I told her, don't go, don't recruit for a receptionist using, um, you, you know, these, uh, you know, whatever, Facebook or Indeed or anything like that. Go and find them face to face. Go and experience them. You know, go to that counter. Go to Specsavers. Yeah. Anyway, she went to Audi. Okay. She went to an Audi showroom, found this woman. All right. Engaged this woman. Employed this woman. So I was speaking to her this week and. Um, I said, how are you getting on? She said, Carl, it's changed my whole business. Amazing. She said, my staff are so happy. Right? She said, the receptionist has coffee ready for us when we walk in in the morning. Mm -hmm. Right? This what isn't a... Yeah. <laughs> well, do you know what? But I'm going to say, I, and I, I absolutely adore this salon owner. Uh, it's, but it is just a really good salon. You know, it's, it's, so it's a really good salon, but it's also not, you know, trying to be ostentatious. It's a really, really good salon. But, you know, that's, that is what we we have to learn. We have to learn to get the right people. Um, we have to learn that there are different ways of doing things. And she, I, I was watching you just now, actually. Um, you was doing a couple of key typing, right? And um, one of the things she said to me, you know, she said, Carl, one of the reasons I got her is because she can look at you whilst typing. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, that's great skill because I sit here every day, especially in lockdown, 15 hours a day, and someone moves my R. At least, at least three times a day, the R moves on my keyboard. I don't know where it goes. So, um, 
but she you know she said so she she talks to the client whilst typing you, you like you know book yeah. you in book you in for next thursday and i'm not saying the barbers need to all run off and get receptionists i'm saying that the barber insected can learn to be better by looking at audi looking at a restaurant looking at a salon looking at anything love it and you know what i was typing it's a reminder to talk about barber fest and your session yes <laughs> So yeah. um, for everyone watching on the 5th of July, Barberfest is happening at Brighton and Carl's going to be delivering us a session and it's all about um, not allowing your client to say one word. Should we reveal what the one word yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, just tell them. We're, we're, <laughs> listen, guys, we are, I'm going to help you a little bit um, to not allow your clients to say no to you. Um, I won't tell you how we're going to do that. There's going to be two very specific areas. I'm going to talk about some other stuff as well. Um, try and keep you engaged for half an hour or so. Um, but yes, we are, we are not going to allow our clients. Can I can I just speak on that a little bit? Yeah. It's the reason that um, Charlotte and I kind of came to this conclusion was because what I'm very keen on is that the only person that should be running your business is you, the 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 the, the, the salon owner, the staff should not be running your business. And when I say that, I don't mean by being bossy. I mean, by them dictating the standards within your business. And likewise, your clients shouldn't be running your business. They shouldn't be telling you, um, I, for example, that, that, you know, that they're going to rebook in, in six weeks time when quite clearly um, they need to be back in four weeks time. So the, the no thing is all about you being the entrepreneur um, and you taking control of your own business. So hopefully anyone who's ever watched me talking, hopefully today as well, I really, I, I'm not trying to be divisive, but I do want people to start thinking. And that's, that's really what the stage talk will be about. It'll be, you know, don't take what I'm saying as, uh, as being awkward or difficult. Take it as that's a point that I need to consider. Amazing. I cannot wait for the session and can't wait to meet you in person and see everyone in person again. It's going to be so good. Um, and we'll pop a link to um, booking tickets for Barberfest in the comments below on Facebook. Tickets are £15. It's a steal. Um, Carl will probably tell us to raise our prices. <laughs> Is that good value? <laughs> Once I knew I was on stage, I did wonder why they were so low. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, you know, you made the right, the, the right terminology was there. Value. That's, you know, no, it's, it's value that you have to give. It's not yeah. about having a high or low price. It's how it's giving the right amount of value for the amount of money you're going to hand over. Perfect. Well, that's a wonderful time to end the conversation on. Thank you so much for your straight you. talking and you make it everything so simple. And I'm almost like, why didn't I think of that before? <laughs> like, I know it's that moment years of practice that's why people when they get to know me love working with me but until <laughs> until they get to know me there's this but anyway people are gonna have the opportunity to get to know me more over the next few months charlotte i've got to say a big big thank you I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you um and hopefully influence a few people and um whenever you want me i'll be around Amazing. thank you so much carl and speak soon bye thank you bye take care